Tessa, should we go ahead and, and mute our screens and like shut off our video for right now? Yeah, you go ahead because I'm going to um, welcome everybody here in a second. So go No, Tessa, I, I'm hoping that when we do I, this screen that I'm going to see the slides. Um, yeah, you'll be able to see the slides because it should be the, the major thing that takes over the screen. Okay, so I like right now I just see a white screen that says Zoom on it. Is that correct? Hmm. So you don't see your, do you see me? I see you. Okay, yep. So you'll see my screen pull up with the, the PowerPoint. Okay, I'm hoping I see it uh, bigger. That's all. Because like our faces will go over into a bar on the side and be very small and then... Yeah, the that's where they're at right now. Yeah. yeah. We'll take over. Yeah, I've actually done quite a bit of zooming, but it always, it always is, seems a little bit different then. It was a thing to definitely get used to when we had to switch everything over to virtual. It's a lot better than Google Meet, I think. I have heard that, yeah. Okay, Ooh. so I'm sure we'll have a couple more people come in, but I just wanted to welcome everyone who is here with us tonight. We're so excited um, and thankful for uh, Rob doing this event with us and for our members. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, Rob will be able to answer questions while he is working, but also at the end. Um, if you have a question during his presentation, you can go ahead and put it either in the chat or the Q&A portion that is down at the bottom of your screen. There's some buttons down there. Um, and I am now going to introduce Josh Johnson, and he is the curator of the show. Josh. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us all today in this tour of Rob's studio and a demonstration of some of his ceramic process. Uh, as Tessa mentioned, I am the assistant registrar here at the museum and also have the privilege of working on the Mountain Spaces, Stories, and Stacks exhibition, Rob's most recent at the Figgy. Now, for those of you who haven't seen the exhibition yet, it features a never before exhibited body of work that features ceramic abstractions in a site specific configuration. It also will feature or does feature, excuse me, examples of his Judaica series, his face pots, and also his alien stacks, among many other ceramic series that will be more familiar to people in the Quad City area. Rob, of course, earned his Bachelor's of Science from the University of Maryland and his Master's of Fine Arts from Notre Dame. He will be very familiar to the people in the Quad City area because of his long history of teaching, including at Clinton Community College, Scott Community College, and Mary Crest. Now, you know, we've referred to Rob as this kind of local ceramicist, but the reality is his impact is much larger than that. He's included in nationally recognized collections like the Jewish Museum in New York City, the Minneapolis Institute of the Arts, and he has exhibited widely across the country as well. So we're very lucky to have him again at the Figgy. Now, you know, this exhibition would not be possible without Rob's generosity and his time and lending these wonderful works to the exhibition, but it also wouldn't be possible without the exhibition sponsors, Wynn and David Schaefer of Schaefer Designs and the Jewish Federation of the Quad Cities. 
So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Rob. And thank you so much for being here today, Rob. <laughs> I'm going to lean down and welcome everybody. I don't know, are people going to be able to see me that, uh, see me during this, Josh? They can see you, yep. Oh, they can see me. So I'm going to change the angle of my screen. All right, I guess that's about it. Okay, great. Okay, I'm standing in my studio right now and my computer is on a ladder. Uh, so that I can point it down at the uh, in my studio and then uh, so anyway, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Joshua and Tessa, Melissa, Andrew, Tim, Michelle, all from the Figgy. I'd like to thank the Jewish Federation and I'd like to uh, uh, thank Wynn and David Schaefer for sponsoring the show. Thank you very much. I, I think this is about, this is I think the fourth or third uh, Zoom that I've given in conjunction uh, with this exhibit and um, uh, this one was a studio tour and initially with the show uh, I talked to Joshua and he said would you be willing to do a studio tour and I said sure I'd love to do a studio tour and uh, I said but usually you know when I do a studio tour I have people my studios connected to my home and uh, I have people come to my house and we walk around that then we walk into the studio that kind of a thing uh, informal sort of uh, meeting and um, so this is obviously a little bit different and uh, so we wanted to start uh, with a few slides of people for people who have seen the show or have not seen the show I'm not going to talk a lot about the show but uh, this is one of the angles uh, of the show and in it you see a painting uh, you see some of these mountain forms uh, you see some other forms some spheres you see a head, um, uh, you see on the right side a big uh, water, what's, what's a watercolor, and um, so there's a variety of shapes there, and what I wanted to do today was sort of demonstrate how I uh, make some of these things and um, uh, how I work uh, in my studio. So if you haven't seen the show, go see the show. And, um, and if people have questions about the show specifically, they can ask me later. So next slide. So uh, these are some of the Judaica forms. One of the things that I'm gonna demonstrate today is using a mold. And uh, actually, you know, there's a lot of a variety of different kinds of pieces in the exhibit. But there's really only a few ways that I work. And um, uh, the, the pieces, even though they may seem sort of disparate, in my mind, they have a lot in common. And one of the commonalities that my work has is that it's, it's, it's generally, unless you see something that's round, it's generally made use, using molds. And that's one of the things that I really like to do. And a mold is a it's made out of plaster. You, you make the object solid first, you make a mold, and then you can make multiples of it. So uh, a lot of the pieces that you see are all painted individually, but the forms themselves are multiples. So all of these uh, would be an example of that. And this is from the Jewish uh, ceremonial series that I do. Next slide. Again, I just wanted to show a few examples. Uh, these are also uh, made with a mold and it's just a very simple open slab uh, sort of mold. And these are two different kinds of shapes, but they're made uh, in the same way. Um, next slide. Again, some more of the pieces. One of the things that I'm going to demonstrate today is the um, is a big boy tile. One of the things that's always interested me are tiles and making tiles. So uh, I'm going to demonstrate making a tile. And those tiles are the shape that you see uh, on the pedestal uh, there. And then on the right side, those works are not made with molds. Those are all hand built, those sort of stacking funny faced forms. And Rob, we do have a question about the big boy. Um, sure. Susan Perry asks, 
how did you get interested in using big boy in your art? Well, <laughs> so um, the way that I became interested was like, a, um, I mean, it really just, it stems from a story. And the story is that uh, when I was in uh, Paris with my wife and we were taking a group, I went out for a run and uh, just on my, by myself. And I went into an area called the Moray, which has a lot of antique shops, uh, museums. It's where the Picasso Museum is. And I went into a little shop on this run and it was an Americana shop. It sold American stuff, old American, older American things. And in it was a plastic bank, a big boy bank, uh, a small bank. Uh, made out of plastic. And you'll see some exa an example of that later on in my slides. But anyway, I purchased that uh, uh, big boy. And the later on, I, I photographed it. And when I photographed it, it sort of fit into the portraits that I was doing. And I, I like, I just really liked it as a portrait, as an icon, as a symbol. And people started buying me big boys. And um, it's really the only sort of comic, uh, it, the big boy, if people don't know, is a, um, it's the, uh, it's for a restaurant, for the restaurant called Big Boy Hamburgers. It's the uh, mascot kind of thing. And there's sculptures of it and things like that. But anyway, th that's really how I became interested in it. And I've been doing big boys in different sorts of ways since then, uh, quite a few years now. I hope that answers the question. Again, these are just some samples of, of different pieces uh, in the show. And you see some tiles, you see a portrait painting of my son, Jacob. Uh, you see a throne, a cup, um, uh, different ways of working. Uh, uh, and then on the left side, you see a face. That's another thing that's kind of influenced me over the years. Uh, this is just a found object, the uh, left-hand piece that was made by a kid at a very special arts festival. And the kid had thrown it away. I found it on the floor. I loved it and it's been framed. Uh, I framed it and I've had it for a long time and it's influenced some of the pieces that I've made. Next slide. Uh, just again, just showing some different works and a lot of the works that are in the show, I see as comp uh, sort of compositions or assemblages. So when I made this piece, I did not, um, uh, uh, when I made this image, I did not expect it to be put together like this. But when we hung the show, I really liked the way these pieces all look together. So I put them together. There was an answer if I have rights to the image of the big boy and the answer is no, I do not. So please uh, don't tell anybody that I'm using it. Next slide. So um, um, these are again made with molds and I'm gonna make these pieces on the smaller scale. And this is a form that I've made for uh, many years. It's kind of a mountain shape. Uh, in the didactic in the show that Joshua really wrote very nicely. It talks about how, for me, it's a lot of different things. Uh, it, it could look like a Ten Commandment. It could look like the top of a cardinal's hat. It could look like a, a mountain. It has just a variety of sorts of meanings to me, and I love them together. And when I lived in Indiana and when I lived in Iowa, I really felt like we needed mountains. So. These are mountains, and I always call these shapes the similar sort of thing, mountains in Iowa, and I've made them uh, in a lot of different ways. And that's one of the things we're gonna make today. Again, a different assemblage. All of these things are made uh, using molds, the sphere, the boxes, and then of course the decoration is all different. Next slide. Again, this is, I think, the last image of the show. Those small mountain shapes are the, one of the things that I'm going to um, demonstrate today. Okay, so next, next slide. Next slide. Oh, yeah. Um, 
Okay, so there's a variety. I could have talked about some of the images that we just saw, but since this is kind of a workshop studio tour, I'm not gonna talk as much about the show. If you were coming uh, to my home, to my studio, you know, my studio is connected to my house. Uh, and um, I built the, I, I bought the home and I built the studio uh, over 20 years ago. And it's really an addition onto the house. Um, I like to show people uh, who come to my studio uh, or home, you know, generally I like to show them some of the things that I have, some of the paintings, because I, I really uh, think that they inform uh, what I do, what I make, um, that kind of thing. So if we had a studio tour and in the future, I invite you all for a studio tour in the future. Uh, you know, we would be looking, just looking around, right? Looking around. So I have just a few slides, not a whole lot of slides, but I went around with my phone and I took a few pictures of my house to include in, in, um, in this presentation, in this studio tour. Next slide. And Rob, we have a question. So what is the best and then the worst thing about having your studio directly connected to your home? Uh, with a clay studio, is keeping everything clean. I, I think that's the hardest thing, which is a very practical sort of thing. Uh, I, you know, I, I taught at, I, I just retired. And uh, so I taught at Scott uh, in Eastern Iowa. I started there when I was, um, I like to say 51 years old, and I taught there for 17 years. Um, before that, I worked in my studio, and, and there were a lot of advantages to being at home because I could be home with my children. Uh, I could go down and work at any time during the day. Uh, I could leave things out. Um, I don't know what the disadvantages are. I'm a, I'm a person who likes to be around. I mean, certainly the studio could be bigger. It could be separate, maybe on the grounds uh, of my, uh, you know, my small, you know, suburban sort of lot here. Um, but I, I really like having it right here and I like just rolling out of bed uh, and being able to go down into the, into the studio. So. It's been a real advantage for me. I mean, I could have a studio elsewhere also, I think, but I still really find it important for me to have a studio at home, a place where I can go work. Uh, anyway, this is just a, an image of my kitchen. And uh, there's some, on the left side, I'm gonna give her credit, uh, paintings by a nun who worked at Mary Crest many years ago, Sister Roberta. And Sister Roberta started painting when she was basically after she retired. And uh, she did these, you know, she was a true uh, folk artist. Uh, and, uh, I, and I collected quite a few of her pieces. These are a few of them. I'm talking about the ones on the left side. The one on the right, the baseball painting is something that I did. Anyway, uh, next slide. Again, certain things that I've had for a long time that have just informed me. This is a piece by Mark Brownstein, who it was made when I was at Notre Dame. If you look at the back side, the back side of this piece is a little under fired and he didn't want it. And I took it and again, it's just sort of informed me as to some aspects of clay, which I like a lot. So I can look at that and it's just looking at something that I truly enjoy. These are tiles. Uh, again, tiles have always interested me. And these are uh, tiles that are from Sevilla in Spain, uh, off the sides of buildings. I purchased them in antique shops over quite a few trips. And so I have a lot of them on the, uh, on the top of my doors. And they're made in a very certain way that I that I work with too. So people ask about the big boy. There's a big boy uh, right there. Uh, next slide. You know, I have these shelves and collection that I think artists love to collect uh, sorts of things. This is my miniature uh, collection, which is, which again, you start a little collection, people start giving you things. 
So they bring back a lot of fond uh, sort of memories of trips and people and all that kind of stuff. Okay, just another shelf and there you see some big boys up there. And now we're getting into my studio. So my studio, uh, what I use as my studio here is a number of different places. So I'm standing in uh, the downstairs of the addition, which is about 500 square feet, uh, square foot room. I also use my basement, which I originally used before I had uh, the studio upstairs. And then I also use my uh, part of my garage. So, you know, I've got throughout my house, I've got a lot of shelving. And someone asked, where do you put all your molds? Next slide. So those are, those are a lot of tile molds that you see right there. Uh, next slide. This is under a stairwell and it's jam filled with molds and molds are like the pieces themselves because I can always remake a piece that I've made in the past in terms of the form, not the decoration, but in terms of the form because I've saved all the molds that I've made over the years. Just a workspace, work table. This is down in my basement. This is part of my basement studio. And they have more shelves. That's, that's what you'll see behind me when I'm working now. Next slide. Next slide. This is my uh, garage and half of it I have is studio. Next slide. So we're gonna be making a mold. Oop, we already got the next slide. And uh, that's, a, that's that large, just stay on that one for just a minute. Go back if you can. Okay, so this is a larger uh, image and then you see on the left side, you see that image of uh, what's in the show and you see the mold halfway open. Okay, so when we're talking about molds, I hope people know what I'm talking about if you have any questions, but that's really the form that's there and I fill that form or I use slabs of clay, the shapes are hollow to create that shape and I can use that mold, you know, many times. Next slide. Uh, this is a little shape. I wanted to show you, I'm, I'm gonna be working with pretty simple molds today, but I do have some comp more complicated molds. And this is that shape. I was gonna actually show that in real life here also, just to show you that some of the molds may have a dozen pieces to them so that the, you can get them off the clay original piece when you're making it. Next slide. And I'm gonna be showing you a little bit of the painting that I do on the ceremonial pieces. And uh, you can skip the next slide, I've got that double. That's a finished one and then one on the right. Yeah, you can skip that one. Uh, kiln, so I have a couple of kilns here at the house uh, where I fire. And the studio, that's a studio image and that I just took a day or so ago. So that's what you're gonna see when we um, when we come back, is that the end or is there more? I'm not sure. That is the end there. So we're ready to go into the demo if you are. Okay. So do I need to do anything? Okay. I think you just need to tilt your camera down. You're good to go. All right. So I usually don't actually work in this part of the studio. Usually when I'm working with clay, I'll be working in the basement or uh, sometimes outside. Uh, in the studio outside, but uh, today I set up this table right here, and I hope people can see it. Uh, again, I'm sort of talking, and I've got a couple of different angles, and um, you know, I wanted to show this piece here to show that more complicated mold. We looked at it in the uh, slide also, so I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to take take this away. And what I did, I'm going to just try one thing. I'd like to be able to see myself um, 
bigger on this one if I could, but I don't think I can, maybe. Okay, that I think is better. Okay, so, um, I wanted to show you how I fill a mold, but I thought it would be interesting for you to, for me to unfill a mold. In other words, take uh, the piece out. So uh, I'm going to do that. And this one that is a big boy tile because people are interested in that. And this is just a basic tile. And then here is a uh, a mold. Uh, I, I filled the mold this morning with clay. And I'm going to take it out. Okay, so it just drops out of the piece. And there you see a tile, a ceramic tile. I wanted to show you the finished one first uh, before I filled it up. Because if I filled it up, you wouldn't be able to see it done. Now, even this mold, I was going to use this one, but I think I will use the same one again. I can still use it. Again. Oh, I'd love to have a question if someone had a question. Okay, and um, so, we have a question. Is, so what about ceramics makes you want to keep returning to it in your artwork? What's why, that? So why, like what about ceramics makes you keep returning to it in your artwork? Uh, what what about ceramics? Well, I'm not. I, I like to do a variety of different media, but I think with ceramics, one is um, I know ceramics. I I know how to do it. Uh, I have experience with it. I enjoy working with clay. I really enjoy molds. Even when I took that piece out of the mold, right? It's a nice surprise for me. It's like unloading a kiln almost, where you see that shape. So I think for me, uh, I was just listening to last night, actually, Jeff Tweedy talking about writing music and, and that kind of thing, and you know, the act of creation. And I think I would enjoy, uh, I enjoy painting. I, I enjoy other sorts of making of things, but play is just something that, uh, you know, when I went through college, I did jewelry, I did, a number of other, another, a number of other media, and um, clay was just something that I enjoyed, so I've really stuck with it. And and I, I like it. I don't know if that answers the question though, but you know, I, I, I think. I think all these artists that uh, you know that I that I hear, they're always saying things like, "Well, I do it because I have to do it," or "I do it because it's really the only thing that I do or I know how to do." I think there's a little bit of that, you know. Um, so I'm rolling out a slab. There's a question: What is the consistency of the product that you're putting into the mold? Like, what is the consistency of the clay? Okay, so this is the clay. I'm sorry that I'm like reaching out and down and stuff, but this is the clay here. And uh, the, if I can do this, roll a coil of it. And this is one of the beauties of clay, is that when you take it and you bend it, it stays together, right? That's called plasticity. So I would say if you've made bread, it's, it's like a sticky dough, it's a little firmer than a sticky dough, but it's soft. But for different kinds of things, I might use different clays. So this clay has a little bit of sand in it or grog in it, which makes it uh, a little bit stiffer. Uh, it fires a little bit differently. Uh, sometimes I'll use an earthenware, which is a red iron, uh, uh, lots of iron in the clay, which is, and it's a much smoother sort of clay. And I'll use that because I want to carve through the decoration and I wanted to uh, uh, want to have that brown line show. So I do use two or three different clays. So I'm going to fill this mold. I rolled out a slab. I think one of the, the reasons <laughs> someone asked why do you like clay so much, and I'd say one of the reasons is that it's it's 
it's primitive, you know, it's basic. Uh, I'm doing the same thing that people have done for thousands of years. And uh, I, that aspect of it, I really, I really enjoy. Uh, I like being connected in that kind of a way. So, you know, in industry, you might have this big ram press that comes and boom, knocks that clay into the mold, very dry clay. But this is done in a very, very simple uh, sort of way. And this is called a press mold. I guess I should have showed you more accurately. This mold, so I don't know if I can show you, but this mold here, the decoration is carved into it. And this was actually made on a what's called a CNC machine. The big boy mold I made by hand, but this one's made on a CNC machine. And the clay is going to go into those crevices, and that's where I'm going to get the decorate. That's where that's where the face will be. Now, when I go to glaze that, the glaze is going to, that's going to be raised and the, clay, the glaze is going to run over those raised areas, okay? So I don't know if you can see that. I hope you can see it. Uh, but that's what's sort of special about these particular tiles. Rob, there's a question. Where do the various types of clay that you use come from? I'm going to just show this tile here. This is actually a casting of a Moroccan tile. So you see a much more complicated sort of surface. And then the result of that tile that I made is right here. I know. The question is, where does the clay come from? Yeah, where do the various types of clay that you use come from? Well, I think a lot of the clay that I'm using comes from Ohio. Uh, if that's, is that, I think that's the question. Uh, it's, it's, a um, it comes, I think a majority of the clay that we get here, though you can dig clay out of, uh, riverbeds and things like that, but, you know, I'm buying a commercial clay that's already mixed up, and I think it primarily is, this particular is a Ohio, uh, stoneware clay. I think some of the ball clay, which is a finer clay, uh, which helps with the plasticity of the clay, uh, that clay uh, comes from Kentucky. Uh, so it comes from it comes from various mines and clay. Um, again, to use the baking metaphor, is that it's a recipe. So you use some of that Kentucky ball clay. You use some of that Ohio uh, stoneware clay. You may use some local sand, something like that, and you mix it together, and you make a uh, uh, you make a clay body that works for you. So for different sorts of things, for throwing, you might use a different clay body than you would for building large sculpture. Does that answer the question? I don't know. Yeah, I think so. That was a good answer. Thank you. So now I'm just, I'm just making sure that I pick up all the decoration. Putting that in, and then I'm going to Do people want to know where they can get the clay here? Is that the question? I think it was more about the origin of the clay itself. I didn't hear you, Tessa. I think it was more about the origin of the clay itself. Uh-huh. Yeah, clay, clay, I mean, that's another thing about clay. Clay is so common. You know, clay is one, I always tell my students, clay, clay is, is a difficult media, right? It's a difficult media because it's, it's, it's a formless media, and you have to do something with it. And it's not like 
glass, which glass is clear and beautiful. It's not like weaving where yarn has this beautiful color. Clay is, it's, you know, it's, it's something. It's, 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 it's not mud, it's clay, but it's, it's, a, it's a simple material and you give it form. And I think that's kind of a neat quality. Rob, do you ever use terracotta? And how does terracotta differ from what you're using now? Well, I do use terracotta, and um, uh, I have I have a couple of pieces. So when I showed that other mold, uh, the terracotta terracotta is basically an earthenware clay. And so when you talk about earthenware, you talk about stoneware, you talk about porcelain. Those things are um, they're different kinds of clay, right? Porcelain would be a white sort of china clay. Um, Earthenware is a very common red clay that has a lot of iron in it. And most of the uh, Judaica that I make is made from that. So I'm going to show you an unfinished piece right here. And that piece is made from earthenware clay. And this is reminiscent of one of the pieces in the show. So. Um, this piece here, when fired, I'm going to show you the bottom of it, is a white clay, and that's a stoneware clay body right there. Is there a, um, a different degree of like strength to the different clays? Like is porcelain more fragile? Is terracotta harder? Like what, is there any difference between the different clays? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, yes, there is. Um, earthenware is fired at a lower temperature. Uh, so earthenware is maybe fired to 1,850 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it's not completely uh, vitreous, uh, or sometimes it can be close to vitreous vitreousness, which means that it's watertight. Um, earthenware tends to be more fragile, it's softer. Stoneware and porcelain is fired to a higher temperature, 2300, 2300 degrees. And at that high temperature, it tends to be stronger, right? It tends to be stronger. Though earthenware has lasted thousands and thousands and thousands of years, as has um, porcelain. So, they're both pretty strong. One of the things, though, is as you get into the higher temperatures, you lose the ability to have lots of color, right? So at the lower temperature, you can have lots of color. So, you know, each one is, has its, there's no clay, I would say, that's better than another clay. But they all have different qualities and properties uh, that, uh, that cause you to work with them in different ways. But a lot of the clay, it really has to do, the types of clay, it has to do with the temperature that it's fired to because all these things that we make, ceramics, ceramists or clay people or potters make, it all ends up getting fired. And when it gets fired, it has glazes and those kinds of things. So that's another whole thing, another whole science really, uh, uh, chemistry. Anyway, so I'm making this tile. You kind of see it, what's going on. Uh, I can put a place to hang it in the back. And I'm just pushing this in here. And I'm going to flat it out. And then you can see that this tile is flat and completed. I also uh, will go in and just uh, remove some of the clay in the back. I'm not going to do it all the way for this, but that just, uh, it, it tends to keep the piece flatter when it's fired. Okay, I'm going to walk away for a minute. I have these little stamps where I can put my initials. So that's generally how I make a tile, and then I unloaded the tile that you saw before. So I was going to show you how to uh, do another piece that's a little bit more complicated. 
And I'm going to do the same, same sort of thing in that I, this morning, now this is a two piece mold, and it's one of those triangular forms. Can people see that? It's one of those triangular forms that's in the shell. So uh, this is a mold. And I'm going to unstrap that mold. And that's, that's this piece. So, you know, this piece I have made, this kind of a form I've made from, you know, this kind of size to about four feet big. So, uh, uh, the molds work very, very well. Uh, this would eventually get cleaned up at the bottom if I wanted it to. There is a question about some of the larger pieces, like in the show, yeah. like the larger mountains. Mm -hmm. um, is there any technical concerns when you start producing in such a large size? You know, it's really, uh, it's, it's interesting when I, um, when I, I do do a few different things when I make a large, a larger piece like that. And so, um, I'm going to get the, I'm going to get this out of the way. Okay. So you, you see how I unmolded it and, and I'm going to answer the question. So now I'm going to make, I'm still going to answer the question, but I'm going to answer it while I'm making the piece. So, you know, it's really very much the same when I make a larger piece than what I'm doing now. I do have a, or I use the slab roller, which rolls out the slabs uh, on a machine when I made those pieces. Uh, right now, I'm just rolling out the slab by hand using a rolling pin. Lots of different ways to make the slab. So for this, basically all I'm going to do is press this clay. And there, there's other ways that I work. I also pour. You can, uh, you can uh, make clay into clay slip. And so that you basically change the chemistry of it and you make it very thin and you can pour it into these molds. I'm not doing that here. I'm doing it. I'm pressing it in. But this is actually also a mold that I could work that way too. Now, if I were gonna do this on the larger scale, which I've done, I would straight, I would put rib, what I would call ribs into it. So I would build a thicker portion of clay down the middle and I might put a rib along the side. So where in some places it's, was uh, maybe a half inch thick or a three eighths inch thick. Certain places it would be an inch thick in support. And I would also build it up around the bottom too. The pieces in the, um, the bigger pieces in the show do not have bottoms. But also you use a clay that has a lot of sand in it. You dry pieces slowly. You fire large pieces slowly. And if you fire pieces slowly, they work, they, they have a much better chance of coming out. How am I doing with time, Tessa? 
We're almost ready to move on to the painting. Okay. So, uh, okay, good. Okay, so this would be pressed in. Of course, an interesting thing is, is actually making the mold, but basically when you're making the mold, I would make this piece in solid clay. And then I would divide it so that I would cast it. And you have to create a mold that can come off the original piece. This is a very simple one. But once you do that, and that takes a lot of time, making molds takes time and makes a big mess. We have a question. Are your pieces always limited in size by the size of your kilns? Yes, they are. It's a good question too. Yeah, you, can, you can't fire a piece that's bigger than your kiln. So if you notice that the pieces in that show, uh, they're cut, uh, the bigger pieces are cut. And uh, that's because uh, I couldn't make them that full size and get them into the kiln that I had. So I actually cut the mold uh, and created them that way so that I could get them into the kiln. So yes. In, in fact, you know, when you make pieces, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, with, with art, art is so much about, um, I don't know how to say this exactly, so it's a positive thing, but art is a lot about limitations, right? So you figure out uh, kind of what, what those limitations are and then you try to do just the very best you can within those uh, certain sort of limitations. Like clay is really good for certain things. You wouldn't want to work. You want to use it as best you can with the limitations that it does have. I don't know if that exactly makes sense, but um, you want to use those limitations as sort of a, as a, I see as a positive thing. I see them as a positive thing. So you work within those limitations. So my example is those box forms that are in the show. Um, they're all the same size, but the size of them and the height of them was dictated by the size of my kiln. So I took my kiln and I measured the kiln and I measured the uh, kiln shelves and I measured the height and I figured out the exact size that I could make, as big as I could make, so that I could get four of them in to one fiery, right? So the, 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 the form itself, a lot of it was dictated by those limitations of the kiln. So, uh, and, there was a certain sort of beauty to that, which I really enjoy, which I really enjoy. So, this piece here. Um, I would score the edges of this. And you score the clay so that it sticks together. You're basically sort of re-wetting it, making it wetter. I'm going to that together. And I'm going to strap it together. And Rob, there's a question. So how long does it need to stay in the mold and does it need to dry before it goes into the kiln? Or how long until this piece would be considered done? Okay, let me let me just first of all, thank you for all the questions. I really appreciate them. Um, 
how long does the piece have to stay in the mold? The piece that I took out of the mold right there, I had just made two hours ago. I had put it in the mold and it was ready to unmold. The tile that I made, I had made that at the same time, you know, a couple of hours ago and it was ready to unmold. So uh, different times, it, of course it depends, I, you know, I'm in my studio in here, there's a fan going, there's air circulation. So uh, it, it dried and the mold is very dry. So it dries pretty fast. In terms of the work drying before it's put into the kiln, the, before you put work into a kiln, it has to be uh, bone dry. All the uh, the all the, uh, the all the moisture has to be out of the kiln. I'm sure when you were a kid, you know, you had works glow up in the kiln in the fourth and fifth grade, and the teacher would say, "Oh, there really were air bubbles in the clay." Okay, that's a, that's a myth. Right? It wasn't an air, but little air bubbles aren't going to make pieces blow up, but moisture will. So any moisture that's in the uh, clay has to be out. Okay? And then when you fire it, you get the chemical moisture out as well. But uh, that's different. You know, you don't want your pieces to dry too fast. If I dry the tiles too fast, they may warp. So you dry them slower. That may take a week if you dry that. It just depends on how fast, how thick the clay is. It's a very unspecific amount of time, but that takes much longer than unmolding. Did I answer the question? I don't know. Yes, you did. Thank you. Okay. So anyway, uh, you saw me strap this mold together and I'm going to just reach in with a coil of clay and uh, just help that seam on the inside. And I'm not going to show you how I put the bottom into it because we're going we're to just move on a little bit. But generally, if I was making this bigger, I'd work with the clay a little bit thicker. And then I would put those ribs in uh, kind of as supports. But there's no interior, like the pieces in the show, they have no interior structure. inside. So Rob, going back to blowing up a piece in a kiln, does that in any way damage the kiln or just the piece itself? What's that? I'm sorry. If, if you have a, a piece of clay that blows up in the kiln, does that have any potential to damage your kiln or does it really just damage the piece itself? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. You know, most of the pieces, like all the pieces in the show, uh, they're fired a couple of times. So um, they're fired twice. The first firing is the bisque firing. It's a lower temperature firing. Uh, if work blows up in that part particular firing, it usually just shatters and ends up on the ground. You have to pick it up. It, it doesn't. It does not hurt the kiln. No, and a, and a glaze firing, you generally do not have explosions because the work's already been fired once. So the, the only kinds of problems you might have is if you overfire the kiln or something like that. And, and if you do that, you may hurt the kiln, but generally no, explosions don't really hurt the kiln. They may hurt the other works around the kiln, uh, you know, that are in the kiln also. Anyway, so that's that. And I just wanted to show you you know, when you, when you use mold, so that's a piece kind of similar to one of the pieces in the show, right? They use this mold. This piece also, same mold, different sort of decoration. I added a chair to the top of it. So you can use these things in a variety of different uh, sorts of ways. The molds can be used in different ways. I showed this piece before, which is also made from a mold, but I added these appendages to it. So you can fool around with, with, with the molds. All right.
So I'm going to wash my hands real quickly, and then I'm going to move the. We're going to do a little technical thing where I move the um, uh, the computer and my phone. Okay. This is like an, a little bit of an intermission. I should have had elevator music ready to play or something. We didn't plan for that, Tessa. No, we didn't. <laughs> No, it's okay. This gives time for people to think of questions if they have any. Feel free to send them in. I'm sorry, what did you say? Oh, it gives time for people to think of questions and send them in. All right. Okay, so I hope this works. So Rob, while you're moving these, we have a question. Um, so what got you started making art? When did you start becoming an artist? Uh, what got me started? Um, when I lived, <laughs> When I lived in Utica, New York, I took a finger painting class and I really liked it. Uh, I think I was like five or six years old. But the reality is, is that I did not uh, do art in high school. Uh, I came to art in college uh, where um, uh, that's when I, I, get, I have an undergrad, undergraduate degree in applied arts in crafts. Crafts were considered an applied art. So that's, you know, academically, I really started in college with really making things. And I took a weaving class, but as a child, my parents loved art. In our home, we always had original art. We went to museums. I always really loved art. I liked art, but never as a maker, just as really an appreciator uh, of art. And uh, I, you know, I, uh, I enjoyed oriental rugs. I uh, enjoyed uh, paintings and going to museums and outdoor sculpture. I just didn't know that you could really make art for some reason. And when I went to college, I took a weaving class. And after that, I took a jewelry class. And that's what really got me uh, into it. I also, in between high school and college, I worked for a belt maker. I made belts. And I think that also sort of got me into the idea of making art, making art in a, in a little bit, uh, doing it in kind of a repetition uh, sort of way and sort of a workman sort of a way. And uh, so, you know, it's really the academic side started in college, but the interest really started as a child because of my parents. Anyway, are we switched up and can you see what I'm doing now? Yes, it looks good. All right, okay, so, you know, this, I told uh, Tessa and Joshua, I think this is really not the most exciting thing. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but I just wanted to show you, I, I had a, uh, recently I got an order for what's called a Seder plate. And in the show, there's a big watercolor of a Seder plate that is, similar in design, the, the painting, as to what I'm doing here, and this is actually the object. And uh, so uh, uh, the Seder plate is a, a Passover plate, has lots of symbols on it. Uh, uh, Passover, of course, we're not in all the course, but Passover is the exodus from Egypt, and it's a meal. And there's a lot of ritual objects that are associated with it, washing cups, wine cups, 
and a, and a Seder plate. So this is, this, this is a Seder plate. So, you know, generally if I have an order for something, I won't make one, I'll make a few, right? And I'll make them all at the same time. Uh, this, this time I'm just doing three here. And these shapes are not made with a mold. These were thrown uh, on, a, on uh, my potter's, on a potter's wheel, on my potter's wheel, or I threw them. And uh, these are earthenware. So if you look, I don't know whether you can see it, but the clay in between is this red clay. And of course, you've seen this work. This work is very, very colorful. So it, it's fired actually higher than earthenware. It's fired to a mid-range. It's fired to about 2000, well, about 1950, right? Close to 2000 degrees. And, but the color, all the color still stays. So uh, basically these works are just, you know, they're just individually painted, okay? And uh, I use a lot of uh, iconography and symbols and, and that kind of thing. I have a, I'm gonna show you this. I don't think I've ever shown anybody this. I've got it hanging on my wall. It's my, it's my symbols. Right, so it's all my iconography, which I like to use, and I add to it and subtract to it, but it's like a little reference, it's, like, it's, it's sort of like a little reference thing for me. So I have little references while I'm working. I love to put these color wheels on my work, and I have them so how the colors fit together well. But uh, so for these particular pieces, I just use commercial underglazes, underglazes that you can buy, like at a hobby shop, you can buy them at Dick Blick. Uh, you can buy them anywhere, well, not anywhere, Hobby Shop, Dick Blick, Ceramic Supply Place, and they're, uh, they're underglazes, uh, which means that the, these are under a clear glaze. They're under a clear glaze or under a glaze, maybe I'll use sometimes a glaze that's not perfectly clear, but somewhat clear, and the color comes out. They generally have to, it's, it's much like oil painting in a way in that you can blend the colors. You can put one color underneath the color and have that color show through, which I really like. I don't really like to use straight colors. I, use, I like to mix them up. I use brushes that are uh, much like watercolor brushes. This is like a, a, a liner brush, a watercolor brush. And um, uh, so basically you sit and you, you make these. I did want to show you on, on this uh, piece, you know, so I, I do the backs also. So the, the front and the back um, of the plate. So, you know, uh, basically what, what <laughs> one of the things, uh, you know, uh, doing this is that, you know, I'm, I'm always wearing glasses, right? These are bifocals. And then I have noticed that when I paint now, I need two pairs of glasses, right? So I've got one pair on top of the other, which really helps me see. That's one of the really important things about art is, is when you're making is being able to see. So, um, so that, that's what I said. I, I think that this aspect is, is not, you know, it, it, you're doing, um, I'm a little nervous, I think, painting, but it's basically using these brushes and basically painting a painting on this, though generally, I know where I'm going with this. I generally know where uh, I'm going with these objects. So uh, this little white color that I'm putting right here, I'm not going to draw through that yet, but I will draw through it later. I use a lot of numerology on this piece. So generally on this piece, uh, what I'm painting right now is a little Torah, right? And I'll have five of these on the plate. I, did, I, do a, I play a lot with numbers in these pieces. So there may be 
uh, 12 colors in the color wheel. There may be seven birds for the days of the week. Rob, this, can, could you explain a little bit of the iconography, iconography of that exact piece that you're working on? Like what some of the symbols mean? Sure. So, uh, uh, so this is, again, this is a Seder plate. So a Seder, the word Seder means order, right? It means order. Uh, and uh, a Seder is a meal where you, uh, it's a ritual sort of a meal that has a service that's before it and after it. And you eat these ritual foods. So one of the ritual foods, and I don't know whether you can see it, but there's an egg right there. And so uh, there's a place on the plate for an egg. Uh, there's salt water. So this is kind of the sea right here, and that's salt, uh, symbolic of salt water. This one here is made to look like uh, unleavened bread or matzah, right? And uh, so that's where you put that particular food. This uh, area here is going to end up green with leaves on it, and that will uh, be for parsley. So all these have uh, sort of symbols, and then and then I have uh, you know a chair. I don't know whether people can see the chair, but the chair is symbolic of leaving a chair for a guest or having a chair for Elijah something like that, Elijah, who is supposed to precede the Messiah and comes to the, uh, in theory, could come to the Seder meal. So uh, then there's sort of personal sorts of symbols too. You know, there's a dog here, which I always said was my little dog, Eddie, but also symbolic of moving in the diaspora or, or, or being on the move as an ex, as the story of Exodus is about. Um, uh, you know, there's certain symbols that are very uh, good for co uh, COVID. Uh, and that is there's uh, one of the symbols when we had our Seder this year, you have to wash your hands a number of times during Passover. So it was already getting ready for the period that we're in now, the washing of the hands. You're supposed to drink four cups of wine. So on there, there are four cups of wine. I don't know whether you can see all this, but it's just, it's, it, it's all the images on this particular piece are symbolic uh, and, or, or iconographic. And they're kind of a mix of my own sort of personal way of doing it. And um, uh, I, I think that actually they're all sort of my own personal way of doing it. In the end, I'm going to look put Hebrew letters on the outside, which will tell the order of the Seder. So it's, it's a pretty, um, it's, 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 it's a involved sort of piece. Does, I don't know, does that, any other questions in that related to that? No, I think you answered it perfectly, thank you. So if you look at the pieces in the show, uh, you know, they're similar in form uh, to the more abstract sorts of pieces, but then they have this sort of layer of story on top. And uh, they use similar, no matter what the form is, they may use similar sorts of icons. I just might lean on certain ones more than I do on others. Um, let's see, what was I going to show? So uh, one of the reasons that I do use earthenware on these pieces, and I'll just show you very is that when, and, and this I've never been able to figure out because it, it, it seems like almost um, to hold, use a whole clay body just to be able to do this seems seems maybe a, a little bit much, but it's because and I use different tools for carving through. I'm going to carve through with this tool, you know, which is just a razor. And when I carve through the underglaze, I'm going to get to that 
brownish red clay. And if I was using white clay, that would be white. But using red clay, that color is red, which I like. So all the pieces have this sort of drawing through where the red clay comes back out to be seen. Uh, not in every area, but in, in many of the areas. Rob, we have so, a question. How yeah. do the underglazes stay when you apply the clear glaze on top? How do they stay? The underglaze, well, you know, it's kind of funny because I like when they run a little bit, but they don't, right? They don't run very much. Uh, they really stay put, um, generally. Uh, you know, sometimes they will run a little bit, certain colors will run, and I enjoy that. I mean, one of the reasons that I really enjoy some of the larger sculpture in the exhibit is that the clays interact and they move and they run over the black areas and things like that. I really like that. With this, you know, it's much more controlled and there's much less of that, but there is a little bit of that. And I like that when it happens. But basically, these underglazes are very, very stable. And if you don't, if you fire them in the range that they're supposed to be fired, they stay put. Anyway, I think that I'm pretty much uh, um, done with kind of showing the, the processes that I'm working with. And if people have questions, more questions, I really appreciate the questions that I've gotten. Uh, I'd be happy to talk. We have a couple more questions. So going back to the molded pieces, um, sure. someone asked, when you apply the ribs, or pieces um, have uneven thicknesses of the walls, do the thinner sections become overbaked or burned? I, so if you have like an, an overly thick area that you, you want fully baked through, but then another area is very thin, is, is there any possibility that will be overbaked and or burned? No, it's not really like bread where, where the pizza, you know, like in a pizza, right? <laughs> Uh, your crust might get burnt on the edge. With a ceramic kiln, the whole thing is getting hot, not just the piece, but the whole area is getting hot. So if you have a thin piece that's attached to a thicker piece, um, it's all going to reach temperature at the same time. So I guess the answer is no. Okay. And then who are some artists um, whose works have inspired you the most? Um, who are some of the artists that have inspired me the most? The most. Well, well, you know, I got interested. I actually went to grad, graduate school to learn how to make molds. That, that, that's one of the reasons that I went to the particular place that I went. Uh, so that is an, uh, a teacher named Bill Kramer, who was my graduate school teacher. So uh, he influenced me quite a bit. You know, in terms of artists uh, that I love, you know, in, in terms of their work and even ceramics is, is somebody like Picasso, right? I love just Picasso's paintings. I especially, I really enjoy his ceramic uh, work that he did and the way that he worked. Um, you know, certain painters and artists that I love uh, uh, are David Hockney and Georgia O'Keeffe, you know, just a whole variety and slew of artists. That's why that show um, that was at the um, Figgy was one that I enjoyed so much because artists like Jack Earl, who I talked about a little bit when I gave a talk about that, you know, using words on work, um, uh, using Fig, you know, doing figurative work, faces, which I didn't, we didn't talk about really at all uh, in this show. But that aspect of art and ceramics, um, you know, there's, there's really so many uh, artists just that I have loved over the years and at different times uh, in my creative process. So, you know, when I was in school, I loved the artist Franz Klein, for example. Um, uh, I think when I was in, uh, uh, when I started making the Jewish ceremonial pieces, actually somebody like Jack Earl, um, Ralph Becerra, they were, they were influ influences, um, uh, 
uh, on my uh, on my artwork. So just a whole variety of different people. Thank you. Okay, and we have time for about two more questions. We have a question um, to explain what is a CNC machine when we were talking about your molds earlier. Oh, well, a CNC, oh, gosh, I wish I could explain what a CNC machine is, but uh, a, a lot of sign makers use CNC machines. They carve wood. Uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, the one of the, so I've, I've used, I've worked with a company here in town that have carved some tiles for me. And then Gail Ray, when I was at uh, Scott, was working with CNC machines and, and carved one of my tiles. Um, but it's a machine that uh, has sort of a, cross access it doesn't do three dimensional but it it uh, you feed a, uh, your computer drawing into it right the coordinates and then a it could be a sort of a drill form that comes in and then goes along those coordinates and carves your design could you almost explain right. it as kind of the opposite of a 3d printer like it it's almost the opposite. It does like you. the reverse. Yeah, of it's not a 3D printer. printer. It really doesn't work in 3D. Yeah. It, it works in 2D. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of a lot of sign uh, people use CNC machines, but it's a nice machine for tile making, and it carves different materials. It carves plaster, it can carve wood, glass, a variety of materials. I think our last question for the evening is: Has your teaching career impacted your studio practice? Absolutely. Absolutely, I, I think quite a bit. Um, uh, how? Uh, I, I think that I've learned a lot. I think I've learned a lot from my students, right? So I've had students, you know, you always have students who are better than you, you know, uh, when, when you have many students and over the years I've had many students. So, you know, you learn a lot from students, you bounce off ideas from students, but also you learn things so that you can teach, right? So I've always been in a situation with very, very small art departments where I've taught drawing, painting, ceramics, sculpture, even uh, computer stuff. And so I've had to, you know, if you're gonna teach something, you gotta learn it somewhat also, or you should learn it quite a bit. Uh, or have a lot of knowledge. So I think one of the reasons that I do work with a lot of different media, work with a couple of different styles, that kind of thing, is because I've, um, um, or, or at least part of it, is I've had to teach those things. So I've, I've uh, tried to play with, I call it play, uh, experiment, learn, uh, that kind of thing. So yes, teaching has really impacted what I do. Well, Rob, thank you again so much for doing this program for our members tonight. And we look Thanks for the, to, I don't know who's here, but thank you for coming. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to come in person, which would be great. And That would be great. Yeah, that would, would be, be great. great. Everybody's invited. That and if you great. haven't yet seen Robert's show, I, I definitely think you should go in and see it. It's beautiful. Um, and to see the works in person just is a whole different experience. So thank you so much for coming this evening. And thanks again, Rob. Thank you, Tessa. Thanks for everybody who came. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.